kind of tying in our Sunday school lesson with our Sunday night uh, teaching through the book of Ephesians. Let me escape that and let me load up. Uh, God kind of showed me something this afternoon. I was going back over my notes. It's the reason why I never get through with a, a book in the Bible or anything like that. I never get through with it because uh, I keep learning. And that's a good thing for me. I do not want to fall into the, the trap of I know it all. I do not want to do that. I know that I'm not going to know everything that this Bible has to give. Uh, it's not possible for one man to know everything. But I want to know what I can know while I can know it and while I can still give it out to people who are hungry for the Word of God. And I want to, I want to um, just sort of commend everybody in this church and those of you who have followed us online and stuck with us over the years. Um, <clears throat> that young man that was with us this morning, Adam, from Fort Wayne, he said he'd been following us for two years and he's down visiting his brother who lives in St. Louis and uh, use this opportunity to come see us. And a lot of people do that. Uh, they may not be able to get here uh, on a normal weekend, but something if something brings them in the area, they're going, we got to stop by Bethel. And that's a compliment. That in itself is a compliment when these people come in here. They see what they see online. They see the genuineness uh, the, the, the realness of who we are, uh, and, and they want to come and, they, and they, want to, they want to meet, not just me, but they want to meet the people here. And uh, I'm very thankful for that. <clears throat> and I mentioned this morning too, very thankful for uh, Brother Mike Hutzel and his ministry over the years, uh, what he didn't tell you this morning. And I was kind of hoping he would, and I didn't want to say anything. Uh, the first time he met me um, really was not that uh, week that um, we crossed paths at a church down south of here uh, with my book on the numbers in the King James Bible. Um, it was at a revival meeting down at the DeSoto Free Will Baptist Church. And at the time, he had heard uh, that I had tried to do some things here at the church, like have a <clears throat> heavy metal rock and roll concert. <clears throat> Not one of my better days. But anyway, and uh, his, his opinion of me, and I would say my opinion of him at the time was not good. We were not destined at that time to be friends. But uh, look how God changed him. To like me. No, God changed me. And um, we've been good friends ever since. Uh, I've had to go to him uh, at times for help, uh, for guidance, um, for friendship, just to have someone to talk to. And he's always been there for me. And you pray for him, because I, I, I'm not kidding you, that, that when he mentioned about his preaching, Lisa, Lisa commented to me, she said, he doesn't look healthy. And I, I just looked at him, and I'm like, hey, he looks like he's had a heart attack. And um, didn't know exactly what he was experiencing at the time. Um, but anyway, we, we, I was praying for him right then. So God help him. And um, so Mike is coming back. Um, let's see here. J July 7th. July 7th, uh, Lisa and I are going to take a little vacation, be the last one, and um, we're going to uh, be out of town that Sunday and the next Sunday. 
So Mike is going to be here the Sunday the 7th to take care of the service. And then, uh, I haven't called him yet, so I, I don't know if I should say anything. But there was a, a man down at Brother Regis at his camp meeting. He goes to Regis Church, I, and I've met him a few times, um, but I've heard his name more than I've met him. And he is one of Regis' good men down there. Anyway, he preaches. And at the camp meeting, uh, his son came up first. How old was he, do you think? About 12? Something like that. He takes the first 10, 15 minutes of it. And I'm like, wow. And he preached like I would, or like I do, it was scripture, 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 scripture. And I'm like, amen. And then his daddy got up and preached a message. And I'm going to try to contact them and have them come the following Sunday, which would be what? 14th? And yeah, 7 and 7. 14. Yeah. Yeah, it used to be. So anyway, uh, that's what I have planned for this summer. And then we got to get ready for homecoming. Amen. So, um, so that's sort of the plan for this summer. And um, I feel bad because I've been sick for a week. And then we had to cancel that Sunday. And I didn't get anything done that week. Didn't preach, didn't teach, didn't put out no videos or nothing. And I feel bad. I feel bad if I don't. Keep up to my own schedule. I don't, no one tells me what to do. I just feel bad when I don't do it. And um, so I'm going to try to give as much as I can in the time that I'm here in between uh, camp and in between uh, going on vacation. So anyway, you pray for me and I'll pray for us and, and God will bless the whole lot of us. Ephesians chapter 5, um, verse 22 uh, is where we'll pick it up. This is what we started on a couple Sundays ago. And uh, again, this is not meant to be an indictment uh, against any woman. Uh, everybody has things to learn. That's what the first, uh, yeah, first Timothy 3.16, uh, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's for correction and instruction in righteousness. Yes, young man. Uh, no, let me do it, okay? I appreciate you want to. I appreciate you do it, okay? Uh, he and I had a talk today, and I like this guy. I really do. And uh, you pray for him. Uh, he had a little talk with Jesus this morning during the service and asked Jesus to save him. <laughs> and amen. And uh, you, you know what he told me? He said he's reading his Bible... And he sees there, when, when Mike said, go to Matthew chapter 5. And he sees that the words there are in red. And he asked, why are these words in red? And who was it? He said to him, well, those are the words that Jesus himself said. And he said, it just occurred to me, this is God's word. Woo! Uh, it took me um, a lot longer than it did you. Uh, but anyway, so you pray for him. He, he's concerned about his mom who's going to have surgery, and so you pray for his mother as well. And uh, we will disciple them as God brings them to us. So again, this is not an indictment against any woman and how she may be acting at this particular time. Uh, we all have something to learn. Men, both, and women, we all have things to learn. We have righteousness to learn. We know how to live the wrong way. We know how to destroy marriage. Uh, we have to be trained on how to build one and keep one. And so, uh, verse 22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. I want to show you some physical examples of this in the Scriptures. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of of the body. Very important to remember. 
Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, I'm going to throw one thing in here. Nowhere, nowhere, nowhere does the scripture require a woman to be a punching bag for a wicked man. It is not there. And I do not tell any woman that is being physically abused by her husband that she must stay and tolerate that. Um, we, we give those things unto God. We let God provide much more wisdom than we have in the situation. Uh, but I am just not, I just do not, in fact, um, um, unfortunately, uh, our board met one time and had to remove someone that had uh, beat his wife up pretty good. And um, we, just, we just don't tolerate that. Uh, so anyway... As the husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body, therefore as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Father, I ask your blessings on your word tonight. Uh, Lord, I'm definitely not qualified uh, to teach any of this in my own intelligence or understanding. Father, it has to come from you. And so, Father, you speak to the women, you speak to the men on the things you would have us to know and the way you would have us to be in our own personal lives and then in our married lives, our marital relationships, our family relationships, uh, Lord, and that will be evidence then in our relationship with you and our relationship with our brethren. So, Father, we ask God that you guide us all tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name and amen. Um, I want you to go to... Uh, let's see here. We've dealt with some of this before. So I want to go to, uh, let's see here. We talked about that. First Peter chapter three is where I want to go to next. First Peter chapter three. I may have touched on this a few Sunday nights ago, uh, but I want to, I want to deal with it just quickly as we segue into the next part. 1 Peter chapter 3, I may have said this before, but I'll say it again. It's the only place in the Bible where it says a, a man can be saved and one without the word of God. He is one over to the Lord by the life and the lifestyle of his wife. Okay? My dad did not go to church while I was uh, a boy growing up here, um, but it was, the, it was the life that my mother lived in front of him when he saw, I guess when he saw that he wasn't going to win, that she was going to get up on Sunday and go to church and there wasn't no, nothing going to stop her and she was going to go Sunday night and she was going to go Wednesday night and she was going to go to revival meeting and she was going to go for uh, the, the church activities and the things that they did. She was going to do all that. And she was dedicated unto the Lord. I guess he just finally gave up. And he said, you can't, well, you can't beat them. You can't, <laughs> you can't beat your wife, okay? If you can't beat them, join them. So he started going to church. And, um, and the Lord worked that out, uh, as I said. Um, I wasn't my dad's pastor. I could not be my dad's pastor. Uh, but the, the man that, that my dad chose to be his pastor, uh, Brother Bob Tebow, who's, he's now retired from the first church there, um, he preached dad's funeral, did a fantastic job. Um, and uh, like I said, the last thing that my daddy got to do in this world was pray. Pray with his son and, and whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord. So I have no doubt at all. And... and let me read this. And likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation, coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of the plating of hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible. 
even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with uh, any amazement. Now we're going to look at some examples. And, I'm gonna, and in this example, it's going to be more by symbolism than anything. Uh, and so let me just, before we get into this next verse, uh, let me just kind of give you a little bit of the symbolism of the feet. Uh, in, in the bone structure of your feet, uh, while you have like 26 bones uh, in each foot, you have 33 connections of bones or joints in one foot. 33 in one foot, 33 in the other. They represent 66, the number for the Word of God. 66 books of the Bible. And in that, those feet then represent dominion. Also by way of the number of toes. Five toes on one, five on the other. Uh, although with my dad, he had diabetes. He lost three, but he still had a good number. Okay? But he just kind of walked funny after that. But anyway, um, the, the ten toes. Ten is definitely a number for dominion. You look at Daniel chapter 2, and that's what you see. That last kingdom is the kingdom of those ten toes that are the mingling of uh, the fourth kingdom beings and the seed of men. They're joined together, iron and clay, but that doesn't work too well. So whatever it is at the top, the gold, the silver, the brass, it's the mixture of the iron and clay that's going to ruin and destroy the whole thing. Because Christ, the stone, is going to come and he's going to hit them on the feet and that whole thing is going to fall down. That all the kingdoms of the world are going to crumble and fall at Jesus. And Jesus then, the Bible says that stone becomes a great mountain. Mountains are kingdoms. And so Christ, that represents Christ's thousand year kingdom. So now, you understand the nature of the feet a little bit. And um, so turn to the book of Ruth chapter 3. Now the story of Ruth is, um, and the story of Ruth is, Ruth is a Gentile woman. And this Gentile woman, um, judge who judges Ruth, her mother-in-law, Naomi, was a Jewish woman. And this Jewish woman, her husband died. So, but she had two sons. Those two sons were married. One of them was married to Ruth, the Moabitess woman. The other one was married to uh, Orpah, who was also a woman from Moab. Two Gentile women. But both of those sons died. And according to the law, uh, if, if, if this man would have had a daughter... On the day she would have got married, she could have taken the inheritance through her child. Through her child. But neither one of the women, Ruth or, it was Orpah, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, neither one of them bore any children. So Naomi now has no one to take over the inheritance, whatever land that her husband had, whatever vineyards, whatever fields, whatever wealth and riches that this man accumulated in his life that would have gone to his sons, cannot go anywhere. It's like it's in limbo, and it, they can't have it. It has to be given through uh, the, the, the firstborn son. And so uh, Naomi... After the, the, her husband dies and the two boys die, she tells uh, Ruth and, and, uh, and the, the other one, I, you know, go back to Moab, go back to your gods, go back to your people. Uh, even if I could find a husband now, 
and get married and have a son, you're going to wait 20 years and it's not going to be worth it. So I don't know that I can help you. I can't. Now, understand this. There's a lot of depth to this. Naomi represents Israel, the Jews. Therefore, she represents the Old Testament. The Old Testament just told the Gentiles, we can't save you. We can't redeem you. We have no power whatsoever to give you any redemption whatsoever. None. So that's why, that's why Paul said the husband is the savior of the body, the wife. So Ruth is the one who tells Naomi, um, whither thou goest, I'll go. And, um, you know, if you stay, I'm going to stay. If you go, I'm going to go. I'm just going to stay with you. In this sense, Ruth represents, I believe, the Gentile church. And I do, I believe, somehow, some way, that God's salvation for Israel will be performed through the church. The Gentile bride of Jesus Christ. Um, and in this case, it was through the, the child that was born. So you look in chapter 3. And what Naomi has told Ruth to do, she knows that Boaz is a near kinsman to her husband. Like a, like a first cousin. And she tells Ruth, Ruth, Boaz is uh, my husband's cousin. He's got a lot of land. He's got a lot of barley fields. It's the barley harvest. Go over there and just sort of let yourself be seen in the fields because as the young men are out there harvesting barley, the law said that they could not take everything out of the fields. They had to leave, I think what the Bible calls handfuls of plenty. Uh, or handfuls of purpose. In other words, they had to purposely leave some of the barley on the stalks so that the poor could go in. That was their welfare system. In other words, you want to eat? Work! We'll leave you enough in the fields for you to go gather yourself, but go gather for yourself. There's a lot to be said about that, but anyway... So she does that, and Boaz sees her there, and he tells his young men servants, he says, see that woman over there? You leave her alone. And in other words, don't, don't lay any borders for her and say, hey, don't cross this line. This is going to be Boaz's barley here. He, he just tells those men, you just let her be. And if she happens to be beside you, gathering barley in, don't run her off, okay? And so Boaz has got his eye on her. And, and Naomi, you know, she's a Jewish woman, matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match. And so, <laughs> it's from Fiddler on the Roof. So anyway, Naomi is saying, you know, there might be a chance here. With you and Boaz. Now, in this sense here, the Old Testament has said, we can't save you. But we can show you the guy that can. Isn't that neat? So Ruth goes out there. She's gathering the barley in. Boaz sees her over there, instructs the young men, leave her alone. She's not to be touched. Okay? And then this is what Naomi, at the end of the day, this is what R Naomi told Ruth to do. She said, you go over, he's going to be winnowing that barley. After, after the day, he's going to be in there, in there winnowing the barley. You go in there after he lays down. And you go lay down, and let's read this. In verse 6, she went down into the floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his heart was merry... He went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn, and she came softly. 
very quietly and uncovered his feet and laid her down. Where she put herself at? At his feet. Okay? Now, I know the 21st century woman will say, I'm at the feet of no man. You want to live that way? Fine. You want to, you want to be that way? You go right on ahead. You'll be making the next tic TikTok video complaining that no man will take you to be a wife. Or they say it now, wife me up. I hate that term. Oh, I hate that. I can't get no man to wife me up. It's because you're a Jezebel. It's because you're a loudmouth. That's because you're bossy. That's because as soon as you get in the car, you start laying down the rules and the guidelines that he's supposed to follow. If he don't, if he don't toe the line, you ain't going to have nothing with him. I'm sorry, but it's just not, not going to be like that. She goes in softly, verse 8, and it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid. He turned himself, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. So it was talking about the, the, the part of his, his robe covering. Uh, he wore a loincloth as a man would, but... Um, just the way that they dressed, I guess, the, the length of his, some people would call it a toga or whatever, um, but his lower garment. Now, I have written up there Luke 8.35. That is the story of the man of Gadarenes who was possessed of devils. But when Jesus cast the devils out of him, uh, and they went into the swine and ran off. The man who ha was possessed of the devils, when the townspeople came running to find out what had happened, they saw the man where? At the feet of Jesus. Why? I am now under his authority, under his protection. And that's where Naomi told Ruth, that's where you go. And she did exactly that. She laid down at his feet. Now, this thing about the skirt, I'll show you that in a minute. Verse 10, and he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning. And I have a whole teaching on that. Uh, that's how God's way is. God's way is always better at the ending than it is at the beginning. Amen? I mean, your, your beginning was here. Your second birth was here. And it may not be all that great, but in the end, it's going to be a whole lot better, people. I promise you. So, he says, For thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning. Inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. Now, you think about this, and think about most Young teenage girls or young girls, let's say, in their early 20s or whatever. What are they going after? The young bucks. The young men that, you know, I'm going to say this. You girls listen to me here and online. If you go looking for a man that's chasing girls you're going to have you a man that's going to chase girls. You go looking for a man in a bar, you're going to have you a man who stays in the bar. You go looking for all the young men, the, the dumb ones, who only have one thing in mind with you, then that's what you're going to end up with and after you've given, about, given birth to about two or three children, and that's not just where it's at anymore, then he's going to be out looking for what he found in you a few years ago. And I will not apologize for statements like that. Too many young ladies' lives have been destroyed because they made foolish 
decisions on the young man that they picked, why they picked him, and so on. Uh, and I, I'll be honest, I absolutely hate that they've turned uh, picking someone to marry into a game show on TV. That's what it is to me. It's a game show. It's a contest who's going to win. I hate that. That is not how it's supposed to be. Uh, my wife and I, we had good teachings here. Preacher Golf um, told us things that all the young people should have listened to. And he said this, and I'll never forget this. He, he actually gave uh, like a Sunday night teaching on dating for the, for the young people. And he said, if you are looking for a physical relationship, it will destroy the relationship. This is not a good choice. If you are looking for a young man or a young lady that has a similar heart to yours, and that is you love the Lord, she loves the Lord, he loves the Lord. If you look for, whatever you look for, you'll find, and whatever you find, you're going to end up having to keep. And he said this, he told us this. He said, you never date someone that you know you would not marry. Now he's telling this to me, I'm a 14, 15, 16 year old boy. As opposed to the other boys that I was growing up with in school. The world and MTV was teaching my generation. Date one girl, have your way, find another one next Friday, get your way. Find another one Saturday night, get your way, and that's how you spend your weekends. But we were being taught here, if you wouldn't marry the girl, don't even ask to go out with her. And um, that always stuck with me. I'm not saying I was perfect, but that helped me a lot. It helped me a lot. Uh, and then, you know, he taught us things like out of 2 Corinthians 6, be not unequally yoked. And he, he said, if she's not a Christian, you don't marry her. You don't date her. If she, and he said this, if she ain't the same kind of Christian as you are, don't do it. Um, when I was, I think as a junior in high school, um, there was a sophomore, she was a trumpet player, and she went to uh, Faith Baptist down here. And I kind of liked her, she kind of liked me, and we kind of got together, and we that went out on a few dates and watched a few basketball games, and I took her out to eat somewhere, I don't remember. And um, this is how the relationship ended. We would call each other on the telephone. You remember telephones? Okay. Yeah, these. Yeah, there's, they just used to put them on the wall. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, those things. But anyway, we would call each other at night and talk. And I don't know what got in her, but she said, you know, I was talking to our pastor about you and your church. And he said that you guys probably aren't saved. And I went, dude, what? And it went, Phew. after that phone call, that was it. That was it. And what Preacher Golf said was right. If, if she's not the same kind, don't do it. And what God was doing with me, 
God knew that he was going to call me to preach and that I was going to preach a certain way and believe in a certain unchangeable, I like what Mike Hutzel said, immutable things. And I'm not changing my mind for anybody. And God was saving me from ruin a ministry that hadn't even started yet. And then there was another young lady. We grew up together here. And uh, her family left, went, moved to Oklahoma. Well, that's where the school was I was going to. So I went out there. We started uh, right back up again. She now is an assistant pastor. I never saw that coming. Never saw that coming. God did. And God busted us up. And I mean, hateful. Bust up. It's not like, you know, let's, let's just call it off. No. Don't ever talk to me again. You know, that kind of stuff. And then, lo and behold, guess who God had? She was here all along. And same kind of Christian I was. And that's what God did. And uh, it, was, it was worth waiting for, it really was. Uh, so anyway, let me, let me get through this. Uh, he said to her, uh, Blessed be thou of the Lord my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, fear not, I will do to thee all that thou requirest, for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a what? Proverbs 12, 4. Proverbs 31, 10. A virtuous woman. Now, read, let's read Proverbs 12, 4. You know kind of what Proverbs 31, 10. Who can find a virtuous woman for a price as far above rubies? But look at Proverbs 12, 4. Proverbs 12, 4 gives you one and then it's opposite. So in verse 4... It says a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. Think about that. The church being the crown of Christ. But she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness to his bones. Now suppose, suppose that I had stuck with a woman that was obviously not going to follow me in the ministry that God has given me. What would happen is I would be trying everything I could to minister the way God wanted me to and having to fight my wife on every turn. And I know guys like that. That their wife is a rottenness to them because she will not go along with his ministry. I knew a guy out at Richwoods. He was a good guy. And if I needed somebody to preach for me while I was gone, he would do it. He wanted so bad to pastor a church. His wife didn't even go to church. And she fought him on every turn. Yes, sir. Yeah, Proverbs 31.10. Who can find a virtuous woman? Okay. Verse, what? The words of the king Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. What my son and what the son of my womb and what the son of my vows. Give not thy strength unto women nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine nor for princes strong drink. Lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Yes, sir. Um, yeah. Uh, back in Proverbs 12. 
She that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. Um, we had a man here um, that I went to Bible college with out in Nashville, him and his wife. And uh, they met at Bible college. They got married and they moved back to this area. He was from Fredericktown. She was from uh, Alabama, I think, or Mississippi. And um, when I left the church at Richwoods, he followed me in there. And I thought, great, because I knew the guy. I knew he was a good, good, hard worker. And he was. He was a hardworking preacher, man. I loved him to death. And um, he was out there two or three years. And all of a sudden, his wife, um, I'm hearing things, and I had a talk with her and confronted her, and it was true, she was sleeping with women down there. And even telling me how much more she enjoyed it. And I'm just like, and I said, does he know? Yeah, he knows, Don't, but he doesn't want to bring it up. Well, that should have been a clue right there, Chris, because he didn't know. And when he finally found out, he came to me, and I said, I'm so sorry, she told me this two months ago. She told me you knew. And it, it was designed to destroy his effectiveness in the ministry. And uh, praise God, he's found him a, a new wife, and she, she was the neatest thing. We loved her. And it was so good to see him get somebody in his life that was not only just a good wife, but a good preacher's wife. It takes something to do what my wife does, to do what Sister Brenda does. It takes something. And you pray, if you pray for me, you pray for Lisa. You pray for Sister Brenda. You pray for these other pastor's wives. Uh, because if anything happened uh, to my wife, I am, it would have to be of the Lord if I ever got married again because I would not let uh, a woman uh, try to destroy the ministry that God has given me and everything I've worked for over the years. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't let a woman do that. And uh, that's just, I'm sharing my heart. I'm probably telling too much. But anyway, uh, he's, he's telling Ruth that she is the virtuous woman. Uh, very quickly, uh, Ezekiel 16 gives us the meaning of the covering of the skirt. Ezekiel 16 is talking about Jerusalem, the Old Testament Jerusalem. And we know how that turned out. God adorned Jerusalem. Now, there's nothing wrong with a woman being adorned. It is not unscriptural. If it was, then God is in the wrong, clearly. Because if you read Ezekiel 16, God gave... Jerusalem, all kinds of beautiful things to wear. Beautiful pearls, earrings. Well, one of them, I think he put a ring in her nose. Maybe that's because so he could lead her around on a chain. I don't know. But anyway, but there's nothing. God adorned her and made her beautiful. But what did she do with that beauty? She spread her legs for every king that went by, for every nation that came by. She whored herself to them. And, and adapted their religions into her, and it ruined her. But here's what God said in verse 8, When I passed by thee and looked upon thee, and behold, thy time was the time of love, and I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. That was what the symbolism of what Ruth was asking Boaz to do, was put your covering over me. The same is the adornment that Christ gives to his bride, the church in Revelation 19. It was given to her to be adorned in fine linen, white and clean, for it is the righteousness of the saints. Amen. God has taken the shame of our sins and our nakedness and our reproach, the, the sins that we got into, and God, through his love, covered us 
so that we're not ashamed anymore. Amen. Oh, I like that. Uh, and listen, all, all of this comes about by way of, I'll just put it to you like this. This church acting the way that Christ wants her to act. Doing what Christ wants her to do. And us submitting ourselves, like Brother Mike preached, in every way. I never thought about that thing of Isaac being Abraham's hindrance. He loved Isaac. Why are you wanting me to kill him? But he's right. Jesus himself told us, if any man love father, mother, brother, sister, daughter, son, whoever, more than me, they are not worthy to be my disciples. And that's something all of us must deal with from the Lord as God deals with us individually about our lives. Tell God, God, you take away anything from me that is a hindrance to me loving you and serving you the way you deserve it. So when Ruth goes to Boaz and asks him to cover her, that's the symbolism of it. It's Christ adorning and covering up the reproach and the shame uh, of his church, of his bride, so that she is a fit bride and fit to be uh, the wife of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Uh, next, well, next Sunday night we will be in camp. Uh, but study Esther, if you would. Study the book of Esther. There's a beautiful teaching in there. And it all has to do with the glory of womanhood, is what it does. All right? Let's stand to our feet.